Welcome, everyone. This is Joyce Sacco with the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. We appreciate you joining us for today's webinar on Land Banks 101. Before we get started, I want to provide you with logistical information. Make sure you get online while um, the presentation happens. Um, you can access the visual component of um, to access the visual component of the presentation. You should have received an email from Val Cobb yesterday, and I also just sent it out a couple of minutes ago. Um, first, click the Ready Talk link, enter your name, email address, and click Register, and you'll be given access to the meeting. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in using the chat feature in the lower left-hand screen. We will also open up the line for discussion at the end of the webinar and make sure all questions that are asked are addressed. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Uh, Winnie Branton is the principal of Branton Strategies, LLC, which was established in 2014 um, to help local governments, community development corporations, and other nonprofit organizations develop successful strategies for combating blight and returning vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties to productive use. She serves as the program manager and trainer for the Housing Alliance um, uh, Land Bank Training and Technical Assistance Program. Through the program, Winnie educates local governments, nonprofits, and other stakeholders on Pennsylvania's land bank law and guides them in evaluating the use of land bank powers to reclaim and repurpose vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties in their communities. She provides technical assistance on developing startup and operating plans, designing tax sale property acquisition strategies, and drafting formation documents. Um, Winnie received her JD from Temple University Law School and her MA from the public in public administration from the Fells Institute of Government at the University of Pennsylvania. A longtime partner and supporter of the Housing Alliance, we're proud to have her part of our organization. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce Winnie. Winnie. Thank you, Joyce, and thanks everybody for joining today. This morning, um, we're going to talk about land banks, um, the basics, and it's Land Banks 101. And over the course of the next 45 minutes, we're going to touch on the questions that are listed here. And these questions really represent um, the questions that um, we've found over the last three years as the land bank uh, statute's been implemented that are the key questions that communities uh, bring when um, blighted properties and land banks are being discussed. So we're hoping to cover all these. And as Joy said at the end, if you have any additional questions or follow-up questions, please um, enter them in the chat section, and I'll um, get to those. So the basic question is, what is a land bank? And for land banks, um, think of them as a governmental entity, yes. And they're created with a single purpose to convert vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties to productive use. So to put that in context, I want to read a quote from Frank Alexander, who is the uh, national leader and expert on um, land banking. He has a great uh, publication called Land Banks and Land Banking that was published by the Center for Community Progress that really goes into all of the details and thought and process that um, communities go through when they're forming a land bank. And it's a great complement to the PA, uh, PA Land Bank Resource Guide that the Housing Alliance published. So here's Frank's quote. The primary thrust of all land banks and land banking initiatives is to acquire and maintain properties that have been rejected by the open market and left as growing liabilities for neighborhoods and communities. He goes on to say that the first task is acquisition of title to the properties. The second task is elimination of the liabilities. And the third task is the transfer of the properties to new owners in a manner most supportive of local needs and priorities. So as we go through this discussion, I want you to keep in mind those three tasks, acquisition, elimination of liabilities, and then transfer out to new owners. Okay, so why land banks? There's really four key um, foundational uh, reasons for moving ahead with a land bank. And one is that it's been a proven tool for attacking blighted properties. According to the Center for Community Progress, there are 150 to 200 land banks operating in the United States today. 
Another reason uh, for land banks is they remove barriers to getting problem properties back on the tax rolls. And those barriers can include uh, hefty back taxes and clouded title issues that prevent anybody from be able, being able to get their hands on the property and put it back into productive use. One of the third reasons is um, land banks can provide a uniform, predictable, and transparent process. In many places, the systems and processes in place for acquiring related properties are complicated and complex, and they really discourage private investors from acquiring those properties. So if you can put in place a process that's uniform, predictable, and transparent, you're more likely to encourage and attract uh, private investors and um, be able to leverage investment dollars to stabilize and revitalize your community. And finally, um, the last reason is um, a land bank can act as a central hub for blight prevention and remediation efforts. We found in Pennsylvania that for blighted properties, everybody's in charge, so nobody's in charge. There is um, dispersed authority for handling blighted properties from your code enforcement office to your tax collection folks to your police, fire, and then your elected officials. So a land bank can serve to um, coordinate and consolidate all those efforts so that you have a targeted and thoughtful plan to deal with your properties. In Pennsylvania, the legislature passed the Land Bank Act in 2012. And I am a huge fan of the act because uh, it's flexible and it's optional, which means counties and municipalities are provided with a tool. They're not required or mandated to implement the tool. If it works for your community, it's available for you to use to address related properties. It's also flexible because it gives um, land banks um, ways to use their powers in different manners, and it also gives communities flexibility in setting up land banks. For instance, it can be county-based, it can be municipal-based. Municipalities can join together to form a land bank. So there's a lot of flexibility in the statute as well. And I think that bodes well because communities are all different and some things will work in one place but not in others. So the statute recognizes that and provides that in its, uh, in its provisions. Um, Pennsylvania joined other states like Michigan, New York, and Ohio in authorizing land banks. Um, there are many um, land banks, um, uh, Chautauqua in New York and Cuyahoga in Ohio, um, Greater Syracuse in New York, and the Detroit Land Bank in Michigan. They're all good examples of fully functional and operational land banks in other states. And finally, the land bank um, statute, um, in, in the statute, the legislature recognized the need for another um, blight remediation tool, and this tool complements earlier tools that the Housing Alliance really championed, like the Abandoned and Blighted Property Act, which provides for conservatorship, the Neighborhood Blight Reclamation and Revitalization Act, which is Act 90, which gives uh, local governments more tools for code enforcement and uh, permit denial. So this is just one other tool that you can put in the toolbox for addressing blighted properties. And the whole idea is to end the cycle of vacancy and return these properties to productive use. So getting to the, the basics within the statute, as I mentioned, the act authorizes um, local governments to form land banks, and that can be counties, municipalities with a population over 10,000, or two or more municipalities with combined population over 10,000 can form a land bank. In the statute, a land bank is defined as a public body, corporate, and politic. Initially, um, there was discussion about whether or not the land bank was an authority. Um, it, it looks like an authority. It can act like an authority, but according to the Pennsylvania Department of State land bank filing guidelines, it is not an authority. It's, it's a land bank, and it's considered a public body, corporate, and politic. Right now, um, there are at my last check is 15 land banks. If um, there are others out there and you're on the line and you recently formed one, please share um, your new land bank with the Housing Alliance and with the Blight Listserv. The Housing Alliance can tell you how to sign up for the Listserv. And what um, the Blight Library does is we 
uh, manage and, 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 and really uh, house all of the land bank ordinances that are passed in Pennsylvania. So it's a good resource for those who are considering land banking and drafting their ordinance. You can see what other places have done. So from this list, you can see there's a number of, um, of recently formed land banks that are just getting up and running and others that have been operating since as early as 2013. I try to keep track of them by having a Google alert that will let me know when a new land bank is formed. And um, you know, there, there's really a lot of information that the Housing Alliance um, retains on the Blight Library site. So feel free to use that and, and look at those resources. So one of the questions that often comes up is like, who should form a land bank and what conditions really favor the creation of a land bank? And this is a list that is really based on um, our experience in Pennsylvania and um, the Center for Community Progress' research. And the primary one is if you have a lot of vacant and abandoned properties, a land bank might be a good idea, especially if those properties have little or no market value. Another local condition that often favors creation of a land bank is if you have a lot of publicly owned surplus properties. And um, for Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, that was really one of the factors that um, led to the creation of land banks in those two cities. Uh, the auction sale of tax foreclosed properties is also a condition that favors the creation of land banks because as you'll see as we get further along, um, land banks have certain powers to try to curb some of the speculation that um, goes on at those auction type sales. Properties with title problems, again, um, there are a number of abandoned properties that the owners are deceased, the estates are really not um, functioning, so it's difficult to get those properties back onto the market. A land bank can help you do that. And then last is sometimes um, the disposition of public property has certain legal requirements, like it has to be sold to the highest bidder or there has to be a, a complicated and burdensome uh, agreement that goes along with the transfer of that property. A land bank isn't burdened with those kinds of responsibilities and has some more flexibility in the way it can transfer properties that is a little bit different from what um, cities and, and towns in Pennsylvania can do. One of the factors that really goes into evaluating um, whether or not a land bank can help your community is some of the problems that a land bank might address. And for many communities in Pennsylvania, they're already paying a significant amount of money to deal with blighted properties, but they're not getting a return on that public investment. Um, there's also a loss of um, household and community wealth caused by blighted properties. As you can see from the study that was done back in 2011 through the Federal Reserve in Cleveland, blighted properties don't only impact that property, but they have a really uh, deleterious effect and a, and a bad effect on uh, surrounding properties. And this slide just talks to you about what that impact is, especially if they're vacant, foreclosed, and delinquent. You're talking about reduced property values up to almost 10% because of the blighted property in that area. And this um, only goes to surrounding property values. Also consider what you're spending on police, fire, code enforcement, pest control on these properties that are um, blighted in your community. There are a number of studies in Pennsylvania and outside of Pennsylvania that um, count up those costs. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the one that was done by the TRICOG, the, tri the county uh, the Council of Governments out in Western Pennsylvania did a very thorough and excellent um, cost of blight study that's available on their website that really goes into um, what all those costs are and um, shows what municipalities are spending on blight now without any um, return on that investment. Here's some of the um, problems and, and conditions that the Center for Community Progress has outlined for reasons why you might want to consider a land bank. Although Pennsylvania really wasn't hit with the mortgage and housing crisis to the extent that other states were, the other two um, subsets, abandonment and systems failure, 
are prevalent in Pennsylvania. There have been a lot of communities that have suffered population loss. There are obsolete housing stocks across Pennsylvania, and again, more supply, uh, low demand, and um, the contagious blight that we see where one property owner um, ignores and, and, and just doesn't pay attention to the upkeep of its property, and that creates a domino effect. So these are some of the factors that should be considered when you're looking at whether or not a land bank might benefit your community. So the land bank has a set of powers that are very broad, and in fact, the statute provides that a land bank has all, all of the um, powers necessary for it to um, do what the statute proposes it to do. I think the statutory language is all powers necessary or appropriate. Um, a land bank um, can acquire property in many ways, just like you and I can. And in the following slides, I'll go into detail about some of these individual powers. But um, it can acquire, it can maintain and hold property, it can dispose of property. Um, extinguished tax liens is critical because there are many properties that have uh, that are underwater with more um, liens and liabilities than there is value in the property. Quiet title the property expeditiously, hold property tax exempt and then avoid public auctions to the highest bidder. And finally, a land bank can convey property for other than monetary consideration. And we'll touch on all these key properties as we go forward. Before we do that, though, I want to talk about what a land bank can't do. And the statute expressly states that a land bank does not have the power of eminent domain. Um, secondly, it can't make a weak real estate market strong. So as you uh, consider what tools you can use to enhance um, your blighted property strategies, remember that a land bank isn't going to all of a sudden make a market in your community strong overnight. It, it takes a whole lot of planning and, um, and neighborhood and community um, revitalization to, to make that turn around. Again, it won't solve all of your blighted property problems. You've got to work on code enforcement, redevelopment, and final use. And uh, lastly, a land bank can't act alone. As you'll see as we go ahead, all of the land bank powers that I mentioned in the prior slide, um, the land bank can exercise those powers only in consultation and often with um, approval required from the taxing authorities, meaning the county, the local government, and the school district. How does a land bank work? Um, one of the biggest uh, pushbacks and questions that we've received when we start talking about land banks is, why do I need a land bank? Uh, we don't want another government agency. We already have all these government agencies that are dealing with blighted properties. So when you look at the statute and how Pennsylvania land banks are implementing the statute, you can see that they're using them as a set of new powers and not necessarily creating a new expensive government agency. So uh, to create a land bank, a local government needs to pass an ordinance that creates the land bank. The jurisdiction can be county, it can be municipal, or it can be multi-municipal. If you're a multi-municipal land bank, you need to have an intergovernmental cooperation agreement um, as part of your formation documents. Under the statute, a land bank can be administered by existing government, department, or agency. It can be administered by a nonprofit or a private sector provider. Again, there's no need to create a new office or a new agency. And here, for the land banks that have been created to date in Pennsylvania, the redevelopment authorities are playing a big role. And that goes for administration as well as um, board uh, member complement. Um, under the statute, a land bank is governed by a volunteer board of directors. It has to have five to 11 members. One of those members must be a resident, a non-municipal employee, and a member of a uh, community organization. Um, the, there is very strong crossover between land bank boards and redevelopment authority boards 
in Pennsylvania. For example, in some of the land banks, there might be a five-member redevelopment authority board. The land bank board will include the five redevelopment authority boards and two additional members, and that's the land bank board. Uh, finally, uh, keep in mind that because the land bank is a government agency, that land bank board members and staff are subject to all of the sunshine and ethics laws that govern um, governmental entities in Pennsylvania. On this slide, um, there's a graphic from the Philadelphia Land Bank, which I really love because it shows um, in um, a, an image what a land bank can do. And the key two components are that a land bank can clear title and return the land to a new use. And when we say clear title, it means get rid of excess liens and, and old liens and even new liens that you know, are negotiated with the taxing authorities and um, clear up any clouds on the title that can um, prohibit it from being moved back onto the market. And some of the things that land banks are focusing on when they acquire these properties and clear the title and return the lands to use are shown in that highlighted block. Side lot dispositions are very popular where a land bank acquires a property and then it transfers it for nominal consideration to the adjacent homeowner. That homeowner then you know, maintains and, and adds that parcel to its property and returns that property to um, tax paying status and productive use. New and rehabbed housing, brownfield redevelopment, parks and community spaces, and um, green infrastructure are just some of the other um, end uses and, 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 and outcomes that um, land banks in Pennsylvania are pursuing with this new power. And remember here, the um, land bank can make problem properties more attractive by uh, working to remove liens and clearing back taxes because clean title is really essential to um, a new purchaser. Think about yourself when you go to buy a parcel or a property you want to get title insurance. In order to get title insurance, which is often required for financing, you need to have clean title. And a land bank can help um, get properties that are burdened with liabilities and title issues. It can help them get a clear title and then return to the market. So the, one of the first powers that was on the list of key land bank powers is acquisition. And again, a land bank can acquire properties by purchase, um, transfers from municipalities, donations from um, uh, people that live in the community that own the property that are no longer interested in maintaining it, county repository for unsold property. This is where um, properties that have gone completely through the tax foreclosure process in Pennsylvania and most communities wind up on the repository list. No buyers through that whole auction process and um, land banks can purchase from the repository. Delinquent property tax sales and enforcement, I'm going to get to on a further slide where we talk about how um, land bank has new powers that allow them to acquire properties without competing against um, bidders at a public auction. And here's that slide. Um, the land bank statute gives land banks special power to acquire properties at judicial sale um, without uh, competing against other bidders. And it does this by allowing land banks to negotiate agreements in advance with the County Tax Claim Bureau to acquire properties that are on the tax sale list. It um, exercises that priority bid and acquires the property at the judicial sale. That gives the land bank the property free and clear of all liens, with the exception of you know, federal liens and some expressly um, uh, excluded liens, but pretty much free and clear title to the property as a result of the judicial sale process. And uh, to protect the property owners whose properties are going through the judicial sale process and the lenders who may have liens on those properties, the statute really imposes um, notice requirements that ensure that due process is met 
and anyone with an interest in the property um, is given an opportunity to object and pay the taxes and avoid the judicial sale in advance. And this is a key power that's new for local governments to use to protect against real estate speculators. Now, in, if you've ever gone to one of these judicial tax sales, you'll see that in many communities there could be hundreds of properties that go up for judicial tax sale initially. Many of them come off after the owners pay the taxes in full. They never get to the auction block, but others make it there. And land banks are picking um, a small number of those total inventory of judicial sale properties to acquire through this process. So there are still opportunities for private investors to uh, attend judicial sales, get those properties, and return them to productive use because it's not a land bank's intention to replace those um, responsible private investors who see these tax sales as an opportunity to get properties and return them back to productive use. So it's really meant to complement that. Believe me, uh, there isn't enough public investment dollars available to address all the blighted properties in Pennsylvania. So private investment and those um, redevelopers are still needed to make um, Pennsylvania have fewer uh, blighted properties that are in need of this kind of attention. There has been one legal challenge to date to the uh, priority bid process, and it was in Westmoreland County. And the court ruled there in favor of the land bank and upheld the use of the priority bid at the tax sale process. That was um, a great win for Westmoreland County Land Bank, and it helped other um, communities that are pursuing the tax claim and priority bid um, procedure to acquire these properties. Another power of a land bank is to hold property, and it holds properties tax exempt. So. In the highlighted area, you'll see that um, the Lackawanna County Land Bank has leased five West Granton properties for a dollar to NeighborWorks. NeighborWorks rehabbed homes for occupancy by low-income families, and um, they were waiting on um, some grant money. So the Lackawanna County Land Bank is leasing the properties to those to NeighborWorks um, while all that plays out. So. Uh, in other places, a land bank may choose to hold property for a future public purpose. And this power allows um, land banks to acquire properties and perhaps hold them in um, emerging neighborhoods or uh, neighborhoods where the property values are increasing so that um, that community may hold on to that property to use it for uh, a later public purpose. Another land bank power is uh, extinguishing tax liens. Again, um, this power cannot be exercised without um, the approval of the taxing authorities. Most land banks um, are negotiating agreements with the taxing authorities at the outset. For instance, when a land bank is created, it will seek to negotiate um, an agreement with all of the other taxing authorities stating that for any property that the land bank acquires, the taxing authority agrees to extinguish the liens on those properties. And this um, avoids the need for parcel-by-parcel uh, -parcel negotiations, although that may be um, what's preferred in some communities. What the, the standard so far in Pennsylvania has been to try to negotiate these agreements in advance so that a land bank knows when it goes after a particular property that it's assured that it'll be able to discharge the liens on the property and return that property to um, productive use. And the extinguishment of tax liens is essential because, again, a lot of these properties have more liens than value. So to bring it back to the market, we have to get those liens off the title to get the property back into productive use. Expedited quiet title. Quiet title is a legal action whereby a person with an interest in a property goes to the court and says, court, I want you to declare that I am the legal and only owner of this property. And um, there is uh, a process uh, where you file a complaint or a petition with the, um, it's a complaint, with the Court of Common Pleas. And in, uh, under the statute, it allows a land bank to bring a single complaint for multiple parcels. 
and there's an expedited hearing schedule, 90 days within filing, and then a final judgment within 120 days of filing. That allows land banks to avoid some of the costs of filing, because if, if you have 10 parcels, you only have one filing fee if you're allowed to file a single complaint, whereas if you, ordinarily um, you'd have to file a complaint for each parcel, so that was a, um, a, a, an additional benefit for land banks to be able to use that single complaint process and then to have um, a decision within 100 days, 120 days of filing um, can also assist land banks that are trying to move these properties to productive use. Property disposition. Okay, here's Here's a key part of how a land bank can um, achieve neighborhood revitalization and stabilization. Land banks don't have to sell properties um, to the highest bidder or for the highest value. They can sell property for any amount or form of consideration and even for a future use. And the highlighted area shows an example from Philadelphia's land bank where through an RFP they sought proposals to develop nine publicly owned vacant lots. Um, they provided that the lots had to be developed for workforce housing home ownership, and um, they sold the lots to Innova to develop those nine parcels, and they sold the lots for nine dollars, a dollar a lot, a dollar a parcel, in order to move those properties back into productive use and to um, create housing opportunities for those um, workers in, in, in Philadelphia who maybe can't afford market rate housing. And this um, ability to dispose of properties in this way gives communities an opportunity to foster equitable development. Again, um, land banks have to maintain a property inventory and make it available to the public. The three sites that are listed here are good examples of how to do that. Um, the Westmoreland County Land Bank inventory and website I always direct people to. It's really terrific. Um, Lackawanna County is up and operating now, and that's a good site. And the Philadelphia Land Bank Philly Land Works site is also very good. You can see um, what properties are available and what their process is for um, trying uh, to acquire those properties. One other note, when a land bank's considering um, the disposition out of the land bank to new, new owners, the land bank's supposed to consider um, locally adopted land use plans. So if you have a comprehensive plan or a neighborhood plan, economic development plans, a land bank should look at and consider all those when it's making those disposition decisions. Record keeping, land banks have to keep minutes and records of proceedings and an annual audit and report of activities has to be filed with the DCED. Those audits are excellent resources for folks who are considering uh, forming a land bank. And those are, a, men, a number of those I think are available at the PA Blight Library. I want to give you a couple examples now of land banks in action. And one of them here is from the Schuylkill County Land Bank. And they received a donation of a bank-owned property plus $10,000 for rehab. They're matching that $10,000 with another $10,000 in Act 137 grant funds, and they're rehabbing the property to make it available to a new owner. Here's a second example. Up in Lackawanna County, um, they're promoting economic development by using the land bank to transfer a property to a developer who is developing a larger parcel next door, and there was a burned out adjacent property, and the land bank acquired it and is transferring it to um, this uh, developer uh, for $10,000. Here's a third example, and this talks about market rate housing, which many communities are interested when uh, they're forming land banks. One of, one of the goals is to create additional new market rate housing for their communities. And in Dauphin County, um, they purchased a uh, property that was mortgage foreclosed in Susquehanna Township. They rehabbed the property using, um, through uh, the project trade training program that was through the Dauphin County Prison. And they sold the property to a new home buyer for $120,000. I want to talk for a couple minutes about the Westmoreland County Land Bank because many um, have been going to that site, and um, the executive director, April Copas, has been very generous with her time 
helping um, communities that are looking at forming land banks um, get started and answering their questions. Um, to the right on the slide is a picture of a page from their annual report. And the annual report is available on the, the land banks website. And the Westmoreland County Land Bank is, um, you know, their, their website showed as of February 25th that they had sold um, 28 parcels. I think that um, the slide there shows 19 member communities in the land bank. There are actually, the last time I checked, I think 20 member communities now. And um, when the Westmoreland County Redevelopment Authority was leading the charge for a land bank in that community, they um, had a number of um, meetings with the community. They had a strategic plan that was created and a business plan that was created. Those documents are available at palibrary.com. Um, and part of their planning process was to start small so they could show successes. They had participating municipalities make an initial contribution of $5,000, and they required the member municipalities to agree to waive their real estate taxes on properties that the land bank acquired. And they also required that um, the member municipalities agree to allocate to the land bank 50% of real estate taxes for five years post-transfer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later when we talk about funding to cover um, some strategies that the statute provides for funding your land bank operations. So if you want to look at an annual report, the um, 2016 one from the Westmoreland County Land Bank is a great example of, uh, and it consolidates all the work they've done in 2016 to move their land bank forward. Here's a couple other PA land banks I want to talk about. One is Lackawanna County Land Bank. They um, are focusing initially on repository properties in Scranton. Um, their first acquisitions were 100 properties. I think all of those were from the repository list, and they're being conveyed out for side lots, housing, and commercial development. The Venango County Land Bank, I, I really like how they have their board set up because their board members include the Tax Claim Bureau Director and a County Commissioner both sit on the land bank board. And because of the relationship between the land bank and acquisition of tax sale properties, I think it's really um, great that they've included the Tax Claim Bureau Director on their board. And what they've been doing is they, too, have been using acquisition at judicial tax sales to acquire properties um, to be conveyed to local municipalities for demolition. The Northeast PA Land Bank is a multi-municipal land bank up in um, the Pittston area. It has um, six municipalities. Um, this, um, I learned yesterday that they've actually been awarded $180,000 in local share account dollars. They have um, they've just about completed their first demolition project, which demolished uh, five properties in West Pittston, Doria, and Pittston. And um, they've also acquired some properties uh, through uh, the judicial sale process. Schuylkill County Land Bank has um, seven members, and it was really um, the leadership for the land bank came through the northern Schuylkill County COG, and um, it recently received um, a grant from DCED, and with that money, it plans to acquire and demolish 20 properties and acquire and rehab two others. Two of the uh, land banks in the state's biggest cities, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Philadelphia, as of 3917, they had acquired 1,840 properties. They have a new strategic plan that is really um, a good read. If, if you're looking for um, some more information on how to create and manage a land bank, they, um, I, I was at the February board meeting, and at that board meeting, the land bank authorized the transfer out of properties that many of which um, were city-owned um, prior, um, and those sales exceeded $800,000. Um, the next one, Pittsburgh, they are um, engaged right now in draft policies and procedures that are out for public input. Their um, community engagement process for these draft policies and procedures are really uh, terrific and engaging, and there's a website and there's public meetings, 
and it's really a, a great way to get your community educated and engaged in what your land bank's going to do because you want public buy-in because it increases your chances for success and it builds public trust in the process. I read through the draft policies and procedures and what jumped out at me was um, a real uh, focus on equitable development and how to use the land bank to, uh, to make that happen. Paying for land banks is a struggle. Um, the statute does not provide any funding, but it gives some, some ways that you can um, you know, gather revenues and resources for your land bank. Um, what's really needed is uh, a recurring dedicated funding source, and I'm going to talk to you about one land bank that's pursuing that route. But unlike other states like Ohio and New York, um, it's, there's, no, um, there's no revenue that, or, or funding that came along with the um, statute. The key um, strategy provided under the statute is what's called the 550 tax recapture, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But what most land banks are doing is trying to keep their expenses way down by using existing capacity for staffing. Here are some of the tools that are available for use to fund your land bank. The 550 tax recapture, grants and loans, proceeds from sales and leases, and um, contributions, fees and interest, new Act 152. I also want to mention that land banks can borrow and issue bonds. Some have borrowed small amounts, but none have issued bonds to date, to my knowledge. Act 152 is a new law that authorizes counties to allow um, the recorder of deeds to charge uh, an additional fee up to $15 for each deed and mortgage recorded. Those dollars have to go into a county demolition fund and they have to be used for the demolition of blighted property. Um, if you need more information on Act 152, I would suggest you go to DCED's website. They have um, a, a lot of information there about the Act and initial reports that are being followed by, filed by counties that have uh, passed that ordinance. So on the 550 recapture, simply put, it just allows um, for taxing authorities and land banks to agree that for five years after a land bank transfers the property out, that the um, taxing authorities share up to 50% of the real estate taxes paid with the land bank. Taxing authorities have to agree. After the five year five year passes, um, the land bank or the taxing authorities receive all of the revenue. Grants and loans. Um, the land banks and PA have been very creative in putting together. Um, loans and grants from different um, sources and um, to, to see how that works, you know, you can look at their audits, you can look at their websites, their budgets, um, and the, some of this information is also available at the PABlightLibrary.com. Proceeds, again, a land bank can retain proceeds from property sales and leases to fund its operations. And for some land, land banks, what they're planning to do is acquiring a mix of properties, some with a higher value and in need of less repairs, and then a land bank can sell those properties to generate revenue to take care of the dog properties that um, you know, really require a lot of investment. Contributions from municipalities. Some land banks are getting general fund appropriations from the local government that created them. Member fees, like I mentioned, that Westmoreland County um, imposed in-kind assistance, especially like website development, GS, GIS mapping of, of the inventory, and then property transfers as well. This is the TRICOG land banks um, that I wanted to talk to you about. Under their business plan, um, they are establishing a recurring dependable revenue source. And what they've done is they've asked member municipalities, school districts, and Allegheny County to allocate to the land bank up to 5% of collected delinquent real estate tax. And this is um, a strategy that's used in Ohio um, with great success to provide land banks with um, that recurring dependable revenue source so that each year when it's budget time, land banks aren't looking around or waiting on um, grant decisions and they can move ahead with the knowledge that they have this recurring source of revenue for their operations. 
what role do community members play? Here, again, is um, a really important point to keep in mind. To the extent practical and possible in your community, when you go down a path of trying to determine a land bank, establishing a land bank, it's critical that you engage the community in those efforts with public meetings, opportunities for public comment, um, solicitation of community members who are interested in participating on the land bank board, and then finally making sure that all of your documents, your inventory, your audits, all of those public records are easy to find on the website and accessible to the public because there um, you'll be able to build the public trust that's necessary to make your land bank successful. What we found is because you're talking about the transfer of property, which is central to um, much of uh, you know, the, our, our love of our land and our love of property and our really belief in strong property owners' rights, when local governments start transferring properties, it's important that they feel uh, trust in the process because there are many horror stories from um, urban redevelopment of years past, and we don't want to repeat those mistakes. So making sure that you're engaged with the public um, is, uh, is very important to your success. So here are some of the key takeaways that uh, I've, I've found over the past three years working in this, um, in this arena. And many of these have come through um, discussions with other land bank leaders in Pennsylvania, the other um, land bank trainers that I've worked with over the last three years, those in the Housing Alliance, and those who've worked with me, like uh, John Cromer and Chris Galata, Diana Kerr and Irene McLaughlin. All those folks um, have um, really helped me understand and think how um, you know land banks can really work to uh, move related properties back into productive use. And here are just four of the takeaways that, um, that I, I see in this new tool. And one is that it creates new opportunities, right? It's not um, you know, uh, you know, an end-all and be-all, but the land bank powers give us and our communities new opportunities to get our hands on those blighted and abandoned properties and turn them into things that we want to see on those spots like parks, like new housing, like rehab housing, like affordable housing, new businesses that can create jobs, and green infrastructure. All of those are very um, much needed and much beloved uh, uses in, in Pennsylvania's community. So we want to do what we can to promote those, and a land bank is one way to do that. The second takeaway is that um, a land bank does not want to become that bad landlord that has all these properties but doesn't have the resources to take care of them. So it really requires a targeted and purposeful acquisition strategy and a disposition strategy that um, meets local needs and meets the community's needs. So you don't want to take in all of the blighted, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties in your community. You want to start small, targeted, build up your successes, uh, refine and perfect your process, and then move on to larger product, projects. Uh, probably the most important of these takeaways, and probably it should be first, is that it really requires partnerships. Um, without the support of the municipalities, the county, the school districts, and the community, a land bank won't be able to operate effectively. It won't be able to use the powers that are given to it under the statute without working in collaboration with all of those stakeholders. And last, again, a land bank isn't going to solve all your problems. It's not a silver bullet. It's one additional tool that's designed to solve those problems that are preventing you from moving from, as Frank Alexander said, from acquiring the property, from eliminating the liens and liabilities on the properties, and then transferring that property out to a new owner who's going to use it in a manner that supports local needs and priorities. So um, for more information, please, um, you can download the Pennsylvania Land Bank Resource Guide and a host of other land bank resources at, on the Blight Library. And the Housing Alliance's website is wonderful in terms of 
you know, news and events that all deal with land banks and blight. The listserv that I mentioned is also a terrific resource. The um, Center for Community Progress has a wonderful website. And all of the land banks in Pennsylvania that I've mentioned, you go to their website, you're going to see examples that you can take to your communities, show them successes that are happening across Pennsylvania, and use that as you evaluate whether or not this is a tool that might help um, your community. So those, um, I'm happy to answer questions now. I'm looking over to um, the chat box and seeing what questions I can, um, Winnie, I can um, read it out loud if that helps. Um, oh, yeah, that's so great. From Kelly, we have, if a municipality acquires properties through a land bank for the purpose of demolishing houses on those lots, is there a time limit when those demolitions must be completed? If a land bank, okay, let me repeat that. So if a land bank acquires properties with the intention of demolishing them, is there any time frame within which the land bank has to demolish the properties? Yeah. Um, it, I think it would depend on the funding source. I, I think some funds and grants require completion of activities within a time frame, but the land bank statute itself would not require um, demolition within a certain amount of time. Now, let's say, um, for instance, that it's a county land bank, and the county land bank acquires a property that is structurally unsound and is you know, dangerous. That county land bank is supposed to comply with the local codes and laws that apply to that property. So um, to the extent that uh, demolition quickly is necessary to protect public health and to meet the local ordinances requirements, a land bank would have to comply with those requirements. But there's nothing under the statute itself that would require demolition within a certain period of time. But you'd want to look at local ordinances and any funding um, requirements that were tagged um, as part of your demolition project. Thanks. And then we had a question from Jill. How small can a land bank be? Four or five abandoned uh, foreclosed homes? A land bank inventory can certainly be four or five abandoned homes. And for many land banks um, in Pennsylvania, because of the lack of dedicated and recurring um, revenue and funding sources, they're starting very small, exactly like that. Because you don't want to acquire more properties than you're able to maintain while you're waiting to sell them. In fact, many land banks are operating as just real estate facilitators. For instance, they will only acquire a property if they have a buyer already in line. So I may know that in my community a reputable developer is developing um, parcel A and next door to it Parcel B is a blighted tax delinquent property. As a land bank, I may talk to that developer and say, hey, do you want us to acquire that parcel B and transfer it to you so you can incorporate that into your project? Or a developer may come to land bank and say, hey, can you acquire that property for me because I want to expand the footprint of my project and incorporate parcel B. So that way a land bank doesn't have the cost and expense and responsibility for maintaining properties that um, it acquires. So yeah, four or five properties in your inventory would be fine. And it's, uh, it really depends on what, um, what's available and what meets your needs. Like again, targeting properties that uh, meet local needs and have end users that are available and ready to take the property is really ideal. Thanks, Winnie. Um, do uh, other folks have questions to unmute, do star seven, or comments? We have about um, five minutes left. Again, do star seven for a question or a comment. The quiet group. I want to um, just, before we close off on this, mention two things. One is, that the people who are um, uh, operating and administering and, and cheerleading for these land banks in Pennsylvania have really done a phenomenal job with um, limited resources. A shout out especially to DCED and the Housing Alliance and all of those communities that have really dug in and learned how these new strategies operate to deal with blighted properties. I'm amazed every time I hear of a new project that a land bank in PA is working on. 
see how they're you know, taking public dollars, private dollars, you know, uh, using other resources to try to get this done. So it's really been great for me to see um, all the um, creative expressions and, and the love of community that is uh, part of this land bank, um, uh, you know, op uh, land bank operations in Pennsylvania. And there hasn't been a single land bank leader in PA who has said, oh, no, I don't have time to talk with you or help this community. They've all been very generous with their time, very um, interested in sharing other people's experiences so that they can learn and, and bring those ideas back to their communities. And then last I wanted to mention, and I know, Joyce, you'll probably touch on this, but the Homes Within Reach Conference right. in December, yep. um, there's a whole track of sessions on uh, blight and land banking. So um, that's a, you know, I've gone to a number of conferences over the years, legal conferences, other conferences, and I can't tell you how much fun this conference is and how great it is in terms of learning across sector about redevelopment, light, homelessness, housing services, all of them are there, and it's just really a terrific conference. And I know, Joyce, there's deadlines coming up for proposals. I know you'll probably talk about that. Yes, uh, Val Cobb, my colleague, couldn't get on the phone today, but she did want me to mention that the RFP has been sent out and the deadline for workshop submissions is April 17th. So hopefully folks on the call, if you have thoughts or ideas, um, please um, send them in. We now have a couple of questions. Um, I think we, you are already going over a little bit, Winnie? Sure, sure. Okay, so can a land bank legally sell a condemned property to a municipality that they acquired at a judicial sale? A condemned property at a judicial sale. So, so I want to read that again because there's a lot in there. Most of the time if a property is condemned, there are maybe legal issues surrounding that title. So I'd have to know a little bit more about the facts um, in order to see if the land bank let me just look down and see. And again, on your screen is Winnie's contact information. Her At a land bank, I just want to read it out loud again. Can a land bank legally sell a condemned property to a municipality that they acquired at a judicial sale? Okay, so a land bank acquires a property at a judicial sale, and that property is a condemned property. Can a land bank then sell it to a municipality? That, those facts, I would say yes. Um, what is meant by private sector provider uh, in the administration of a land bank? I'll give you an example. The Schuylkill County Land Bank, um, for its initial administra administration, Chris Galata, who's a uh, consultant, is administering the land bank to help them get set up. So you can make arrangements with a consultant, uh, you know, whoever you see who has the abilities to uh, administer your land bank, you can do that and the statute allows that. Can a local community organization become a land bank? No, a land bank is a governmental entity, so it has to be formed by, a, um, by ordinance by a county or municipal government or group of municipalities. It can't be formed by a local community organization. There has to be some governmental action. Um, and then can a land bank acquire property for rehab and use exclusively for tra transient housing or dedicated affordable housing? A land bank can acquire property for rehabilitation, yes, for all uses. Um, I don't know what tra transient housing would just be short term. I assume, yeah. Tim, short if you want to unmute, uh, it's star seven. Assuming, and then I see next after that is assuming a cooperative nonprofit wants it. So a, a provider of, of housing um, that may be short term or transient housing, yeah, that would all be spelled out in um, you know the land bank's acquisition and disposition strategies. For instance, if there is a a plan or a uh, a, a strategy, or if there's a plan or a desire in a community to have uh, certain uh, properties be available for affordable housing or for transient housing, sure, a land bank can acquire properties and, and help to achieve that local land use goal. The idea is that the land bank isn't the planner. A 
Land Bank is there to help to implement local plans. And if there is local desire and local priorities that say we want um, to make land um, available for um, use for affordable housing, for transient housing, a land bank can assist with acquiring those properties to be transferred to the appropriate new owner who's going to develop those projects in accordance with um, local priorities and local uh, you know, determinations. Thanks. And then there's, we can uh, end with one final question. Are there any, uh, are there many examples of collaborations between land banks and community land trusts in Pennsylvania? There um, are, a, a I know in Pittsburgh there is um, a, a land trust that has been very instrumental in um, leading up to the formation of the, uh, the Pittsburgh Land Bank. I think it's the Allegheny Land Trust, but I, I'm not certain of the name. We've talked internally about, um, and, and in certain community settings too, about how land banks can um, work with land trusts to advance both of the objectives of those two kinds of organizations. And if, um, if you send me, or Joyce, if you can give me this person's email, I know I've read one or two articles that I have saved that talk about the relationship between land banks and land trusts and how they can work together. I'm happy to share those. I just can't remember all the details of them off the top of my head. Great. Thanks. Um, and th thank you, Winnie, so much. It's really informative, and thanks, everyone, for getting on. And have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce.